the difference. One cup at a time. Tea time. Yeah, this is tea time. Yeah. Make it a difference. One cup at a time. Tea time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time. Make it a difference. One cup at a time. Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, wherever you may be tuning in from. It is tea time again, and that's right. Today, I have an incredible guest joining me, Gerald Everett Jones, and we are going to be talking about a lot of different things today. We're going to be talking about publishing, we're going to be talking about free speech, book banning, all of that good stuff, and we're going to get to know what Ger Gerald's tea is. So before we start that, we're going to do the disclaimer, and then we're going to do a little bio intro, and then we're going to bring the incredible guest up front so he can share his story and why he is here and what his tea is today. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live shows. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to use your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time shows hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogue and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the given time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participation, participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking action, any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions that might be emotional at risk for some. It is significant to know that this show is engaging discussion forms only to to offer and inspire awareness, connection, and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about this dis disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in this show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that this show is not good for you at this time, I respect that and we'll see you at a f future show at a later date. Now, my incredible guest, Gerald, this man is a man of many flavors, many blends. So I really want to bring him up so you can see who I'm introducing and then I'm going to let him share, but I'm going to do a little intro, but I want to bring him onto the stage. So Gerald, welcome to Tea Time. Happy to join Kenyan <laughs> Black Tea. <laughs> <laughs> now that is a tea you like to drink, but that is not your tea. Your tea is different. We do tea a little different here, but that is a good tea. I'll have to try that tea. I've never it's heard of that tea one. time somewhere in the world. <laughs> it is, right? It, it, it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> and, and that's, what they, that's what the Brits say about, you know, their gin and tonic. <laughs> it is, right? So I'm going to just do a little intro of who you are, Gerald, and then I'm going to let you share all of that good stuff that you're doing. I really want to get into the book banning, understanding that, understanding the pen and understanding the free speech as well. And then we're going to get into a little bit of the publishing and your radio host shows and all that good stuff. So we have an incredible show lined up for us today. So Gerald, in, um, let me get where Gerald is. Gerald, uh, do, 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 do. I'm just going to do a little intro, but if, TV. <laughs> pardon? I, 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 it was interesting to, to hear your terms and conditions. I'm not a lawyer, but I express, I expressly reserve the right to play one on TV. <laughs> I, and I am in Hollywood, by the way. I mean, you know, I'm here on the left coast, just six blocks from the blue Pacific. So, well, there you go. See, I bring everybody in to have tea with me. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit on Gerald. I'm just going to do the little bio of Gerald, and then we're gonna we're gonna get into his tea and that and all that good stuff. If you'd like to see his full bio, you can check out Miss Liz's Tea Time Facebook page or any of my platforms. That all of his bio will be there. For anyone who is listening to the audio, it will be in the description on who my guest is, so you can find all that good stuff in there, and you can reach out to Gerald as well to have him on your platform. And I believe that Gerald, you were, you came through RadioGuest.com as well, right? 
Uh, my publicist, uh, Luann Sedano, uh, booked me in. How she waves her magic wand, I have no idea. Yeah, I, I believe that's where you came from. Good I get a lot of incredible guests from uh, RadioGuest.com. So for anyone that is coming on Tea Time, if you're from Radio Guest, I want to thank Radio Guest for that as well. So a little bit on Gerald. And then we're going to get into some tea here. Uh, where did I go? Or how about I just let you introduce yourself a little bit, Gerald? It's easier for you to tell me who you are, what you do, and all that good stuff. I am a professional writer, author, and I have been for, I hesitate to say how many years, but I, in, in college, I had one of the women I dated said, well, actually, you, you say you want to be a writer, but I think you really are an actor because you keep doing these accents and you know you're kind of a show off and so i did study acting and after that <laughs> and i did i did a couple of seasons in summer stock and i actually i i thought that i was going to be an actor i in graduate school i i applied for juilliard and i auditioned for the um, irritable john houseman and who who finished the interview by saying just why is do you, do you assume that you could possibly be an, be an actor? Um, <laughs> then, um, I got discouraged by the idea of uh, I didn't even try to wait tables in New York after I got out of school, so uh, I went back to Chicago where my parents were living, and I uh, went door to door during a particularly difficult time in the employment world and uh, finally got a job as an advertising copywriter. So I, I, I went back into writing, whether I liked it or not. And then I spent really quite a lot of my life as a nonfiction a book, actually, a lot of magazine, technical magazine and also business and technical books. And um, I was always writing spec screenplays, plays. And later in my life, it was more recently, I... I, and I, I was represented by a pretty high-powered agent for the nonfiction books. I had a, I, I, it's still out there. There's a book called How to Lie with Charts that is taught at Georgetown. And so if any of your uh, congressmen are lying to you, maybe it's my fault. But um, the agent that I had at the time, I said, well, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm actually going to start writing novels full time. And he said, have a nice life, kid. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, so we don't represent fiction, which actually wasn't quite true. I found out later, but it wasn't going to represent me. So I, uh, I learned how to get my own uh, small press imprint. And since that time, I have written a dozen novels. And over the last three years, I have won, I think it's up to 16 book awards. Um, two series. One is a, a satire coming of age series. And then there is comic, I guess you'd say, romantic comedy. I did a series of mysteries, uh, the Evan Wycliffe uh, Preacher series. And that was one of the most recent ones. And that one's won seven awards so far wow. uh, in mystery thriller. Uh, I wrote a literary novel, as I'd mentioned to you before we went on the air. Um, Harry Harambe's Kenyan Sundowner is a literary novel about my years living in Kenya, which we can talk, talk about if you're interested. And some other literary novels, Mr. Ballpoint, which is uh, about uh, inspired by a true story about the guy right after World War I or World War II, who introduced the ballpoint pen, which was kind of the iPhone of its day. Uh, Christmas Karma, which is something of an homage to Ann Tyler, because I'm such a fan of hers. But then I'm also a fan of John le Carre. So I'm, I'm, I've written uh, thrillers as well. So that's been my... That's been my gig. I also still do um, editorial consulting, development consulting, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, I am happy to help, especially writers who are just jumping in um, with their, I, I have even ghost written a couple of novels for uh, people who come to me and say, well, I've got this great idea. I just need to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the first step, right? Yeah, is writing it down. Good ideas, good ideas might be overrated, as William Shakespeare, but um, yeah. Um, I, I, so I work. I work as a writer, and um, 
uh, when my wife said she wanted to, we, we'd been to Africa seven times and she'd been working as a journalist in ecotourism. And um, she said, well, I want to work with elephants and, and the only way I'm going to do it is I'm going to be, able, I'm going to have to go there. And I said, well, you know, if there's a place to plug in my computer, I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, so I can bring the computer. I'm good to go. I live in a, I live in a screen. Okay, <laughs> and just like, so it wasn't a problem. I, and I did write. I did write the, um, a substantial portion of that book about Africa while while we were there. We were there for two years, and we came back right before COVID hit. And I I say somewhat facetiously, we came back from Kenya. We didn't. We weren't really sure how long we were going to stay. Uh, we we thought maybe we might not ever come back because it's a really, rather attractive place to retire. But um, we came back when things got interesting in Kenya, and only to find that things got even more interesting here. And then COVID broke out. So uh, some of the political turmoil and the corruption that we saw in Kenya. Um, made me think somewhat more Kenyan in terms of my worldview. I, I think I see, I see nefarious plots <laughs> um, everywhere I look. Uh, but um, it, I've, I've always been, I, I think, politically aware. I've had quite a bit of uh, education in not only um, uh, history, but also philosophy and economics. So uh, I, and, and business, I, along the way, I have flown a desk or two uh, as a business manager and uh, that informs my that informs my work as well as Raymond Raymond Chandler by the way was an oil company executive I didn't know that until I met uh, the woman who had been his uh, secretary at Paramount oh and wow she, and she said uh, and he he would always say work broadens us and uh, there's no there's certainly no reason to to shirk being out in the business world and 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 wearing those hats because it will greatly inform uh, the quality of your work and the and the uh, the truthfulness, the verisimilitude of, of what you put down and, and the scenes and, and circumstances you, you describe. I, I was raised as a Southern Baptist in, in Missouri, and um, uh, I was, in fact, a student minister in high school before I went to college and learned way too much about Christianity. Uh, but uh, my my Evan Wycliffe books are about a somewhat agnostic minister in in that farm town of southern Missouri, which is where a lot of my relatives were from. And so, yes, going back to that rule, write what you know. I I do know about that part of the world, and I do know about small town gossip and rural intrigue and land grab, <laughs> uh, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. So I, I have great fun as a writer. And, and one of the things I think that I would, I would, I would offer, I don't know what I would say as a word of advice, because I, as a business writer, I certainly always wrote faithfully to outlines. And I'm, I was usually writing for an editor who would slap my wrist if I ever departed from the outline. But, you know, since I've started writing fiction, I really I have a notion of where it's going to go, and but then once once those characters get created and clothed and put on the page, they just kind of go where they want to go. And yeah. I write to surprise myself, and I feel as though if I can surprise and please myself, I can possibly surprise and please my, my readers. And I've had a number of reviewers who have said, you know, I really didn't see... I really didn't see that. What happened on that last page? I just didn't see it coming. And I, neither did I. <laughs> oh, so you're one of those thrillers that keep you hanging yeah, no, right I mean, at and, the end. It's, it's, it's amazing the way your subconscious mind works as, as, a, as a writer. Because, yes, things can literally come to you in the shower. The, re the reason, scientifically, the reason things come to you in the shower is showers emit white noise. White noise stimulates parts of your brain that are not like paying attention at the time. Oh, so that's that's one explanation anyway. And the other the other um, thing about the subconscious is uh, the the psychiatrist uh, Milton Erickson, who was fond of storytelling as a therapeutic method, uh, was of the opinion that the subconscious mind never forgets anything, and he felt as though the power of a story is much greater after your conscious mind thinks it's forgotten it. And that way the 
the the censoring um, mechanisms of the of the conscious mind that says no, you shouldn't do that, or you shouldn't you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. If it gets out of the way, the story can work in the subconscious. And often, what I will say to, for example, classes or writers groups uh, that I have taught, um, how many of you remember Moby Dick? And you know, the, most of them will say, "Yeah, we studied it in high school." I said, okay, "Well, can you tell me the plot?" Well, yeah, there was a white whale and a captain. Well, beyond that, they probably can't remember much of anything. And I said, "I submit to you, Moby Dick is part of the Western canon of literature that exists in your subconscious, and if that's the way you were brought up, that informs all of your actions, all of your attitudes, and that's true of." Sunday school lessons, Bible parables, um, what you learned in, in, in Hebrew school, really anything that you encountered as a so-called moral lesson or a story that had a consequence is all part of what makes you the person that you are. And that's, that's often what I say to writers is, you know, Yes, we all have to be concerned about the size of our fan base and how many unit sales and all like that, and our position as bestseller. Oh, we always got to worry about those numbers. But, but a hundred years from now, you know, there there may be one or two people that you influence that are going to make some kind of decision that that has some effect on the world, and you're never going to know. You will never know, and certainly, you know, name an author that you admire. You know. Um, somebody like um, Philip Roth, okay, who was very non-me too, wrote male-centered fiction. <laughs> but one of the things about his story was, his stories were, it really all had to do with the consequences of bad relationship decisions, okay, and of, of, of male arrogance, as it were, or, or male sexual way, waywardness, whatever, because this was also during the, you know, right after the birth control, the Hugh Hefner era, whatever. But, you know, I submit that that, that that tradition, you know, he's not with us anymore. And I doubt that he would ever know uh, how many people of the current generation who have studied him in English class uh, will have been influenced by his writing. And, you know, when you look at his Wikipedia page, you, you've got to keep scrolling because the number of... Yeah, it's just is, long. <laughs> just mean, he's going on and on and on, right? Incredible. I mean, I, I'm proud of a dozen novels. And, I, there, and indeed, there have been some there have been some Nobel Prize winners who've written fewer volumes than me. But, <laughs> but good old Phil Roth, you know, he, he wrote a lot of them. So have any of your books gone to a movie screen, like to the screen? No, I'm actually a member of the Writers Guild, and I, I, I was, I was awarded for a few movie scripts that I wrote, uh, spec movie scripts, and some of them got optioned, but none of them got made. The one that was most that got the closest, one of my novels, Christmas Karma, the one that is. Um, uh, something of an homage to Ann Tyler. It's about a, a dysfunctional family around Christmas time, and people come knocking on the door that <laughs> that they kind of have an agenda. <laughs> you know, people. So is it something like Charlie Chase? Uh, was it Charlie? Not. I'm trying to think. Uh, was it Charlie Chase? No. Charlie Chase. Uh, no, no. I'm. I, his last name's Chase. I'm trying to think of his first name. They they had like a comical Christmas where the family all got together and and, and the turkey got burnt and. Oh, it's, it's not 19... so much about it's not so it, it is something about dark comedy, but but it's more about about um, a family that's dysfunctional that that doesn't expect to be together at Christmas, and quite a few of them show up, <laughs> in, in, including including Willa, the, the, who's middle middle aged main character. Her father had been gone for twenty years, and he'd say, "Oh, he worked for the secret government." And, you know, he, he went off and nobody knew what happened to him. And they thought, well, maybe he'd been killed in a war. Well, he shows back up and he looks like a homeless guy. And he says, oh, by the way, I, you know, I understand your, your, your poor mother is, has passed away. That's unfortunate. But by the way, the title in the house is still in my name and you've got a week to get out. Wow. <laughs> so that, that was, that, that actually was, began life as a screenplay, Christmas Karma, and the Writers Guild awarded it a diversity award, which is funny because the Writers Guild Diversity Award is awarded to writers over 50. 
Now, I think actually it would be just as fair to award it to writers over 40. Because <laughs> in Hollywood, if you're, you know, if you're not 20 something or 30 something, maybe you're not in the game. But uh, yeah, we had a staged reading at the Writers Guild of Christmas Karma and the dear beloved Orson Bean, if you remember him, uh, the crusty father who, who wants the house back. Orson, I, I knew him from the barbershop. I actually, I, I used to see him in the barbershop. I mean, he was probably at the time, he might have been, he might have been the other side of 90 years old. But uh, he, and, and my wife, uh, Georgia, who's an actress, she played Willa and uh, there was Orson as, as her father and Sparks flew. No, that was that was that was quite, quite a reading. I, I thought, you know, the phone was going to really ring off the hook after that. No, <laughs> didn't happen. So, what what's your favorite memory of Hollywood? Like, you're in Hollywood right now, right? Yeah, I live in Santa Monica, um, and that's something of a well, it used to be kind of a bedroom community for the studios because you know MGM Culver City, it, which is now Sony, is pretty close. And um, um, Fox, uh, the Fox lot, which of course is now owned by Disney, is uh, pretty close. And then you got to go over the mountains to the valley to get to, you know, Warner Brothers and Burbank and, and such. But I've, I've been on all the lots and I've, I've, I've had relationships, professional relationships with people at the studios. And I, I, I even actually worked for Disney in the business department for, for, um, for a year as a consultant. So, so yes, I, one of the things that really jazzes me about being here is just, especially the MGM lot, the current Sony lot is so filled with history. And that was where the, the contract players, there was, there was just an army of contract players there and they're, you know, churning out a movie every week or whatever. And I don't know if you've ever seen that photograph of like all of the MGM contract players that were together at this one event. And, it, you know, it's just, I mean, there must've been 150 of them or something. And, you know, and there's like <laughs> the whole first rows, all recognizable faces. Oh, wow. Funny because, you know, our two terriers, my, my wife wrote this wonderful book, Terriers in the Jungle, about narrated by our two Jack Russell terrorists but Romeo, the boy, has got big ears. And so he reminds me of Clark Gable. And Roxy's got big eyes. So she, <laughs> she reminds me of Claudette Colbert. So between them, they're, you know, they're, they're just another episode of it happened one night. <laughs> you know, the dog fun. adventures. No, yeah, the, 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 the terriers went with us to Africa. And, and they're, they're, the way that they confronted wildlife, I mean, the monkeys in the trees are as common as squirrels and our apartment was right at tree level and those monkeys you know between between <laughs> there's six, a lot of monkey business between, <laughs> between six and eight a.m they're jumping on the balcony or staring in the windows like how are you still here this is where we live <laughs> is so gerald what what really got you into writing like what age were you when you first started writing my my dad was a chemical engineer who had quite a scientific background, lifelong interest in science. And I think he really wanted me to be a research scientist. And so in my junior high school years, I was very active in science fairs and, you know, puttering around in the basement with experiments and whatever. And I, I, don't know, I think maybe the turning point was I was go. I was trying for a first place in the science fair, and I got a second place. <laughs> that was it. No more science. Like, this, this, of course, you know I've gotten all kinds of second places in my writing career. I don't know why that should have made a difference. I should have learned to cope with rejection. But anyhow, as I went into high school, I I became more and more interested in in writing, both expository writing and and fiction. And actually, I'd already won. Up to that point, I already won two writing awards. I won uh, an award from the Kansas City Public Library when I was in fourth grade for my essay, Why Most People Like Tom Sawyer. <laughs> I, I got two tickets to The Wizard of Oz for that. And then um, and then I got these, I won a, a second award, <laughs> not a first, in the Scholastic Schaefer uh, Writing Awards when I was uh, in, in sixth grade. 
which was a short story about a um, now see remember this was at the very beginning of computers and robotics and my short story was about um, the mayor of a town who uh, replaced his uh, live uh, full-blooded uh, secretary with a uh, a smart robot and then uh, really regretted the choice so that was a somewhat humorous story and that was in war book. so yes through high school i became more and more interested in writing and i also more to the point in terms of of when we're talking about book banning and and self-expression whatever i think a really significant thing was i was president of the debate club and one of the things about the debate club was they would tell you what the topic was the the, the debate competitions um, some weeks in advance, but you would never know which side you were debating until you were actually in the room with your competitive team, which would oh. be from another high school. Now, I went to high school, uh, it was How Howard High School in Ellicott City, Maryland. It was at the time, uh, it was a relatively rural suburban school with not a huge budget. And our debate club had maybe 10 people in it <clears throat> and we didn't really have an army of people to do research for us and of course we were juggling you know debate school is a an elective and it's something that happens you know after school mostly so um the ability to research the topic we didn't we weren't able to do that i know maybe you said we were lazy but we went up against you know um uh some of the Fairfax County schools, you know, they're in the Washington Beltway. And, you know, these debate clubs, the schools are very well funded. The debate clubs might have had 50 kids in them. And, you know, half half of the debate club was just basically researchers. So these guys would walk in debates with briefcase fulls of file cards on both sides of the subject. <laughs> and so, you know, there's three ways that you can win. In, in, in debate, there's evidence, which would be the file cards of the research. There's logic and there, to, to a minor extent, passion. And that's one of the things that you learn in debate is to disengage yourself from passion, from, you know, it's fine to believe in your topic, but the thing is you don't know which one you're going to be assigned or which side you're going to be assigned. So you'd better be able to argue either side with equal passion and fervor. Now, you might say you're faking it, but that's a skill. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's old, old, the old saying, too, right? right? Make it till if, you make it. Attorneys don't know how to argue the other side. They're going to lose the case. Yep. They need to understand the other side as well on their, their own. So one of the interesting things was, as, as the low-budget debate club, we learned, because we didn't have evidence, we learned to win on logic. <laughs> so we did, we, we, we practiced those types of exercises and those types of, of games, if you will. And, you know, it's interesting because when I've talked about this before, I've, I've compared it to um, um, I, 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 having grown up in, in, in Missouri, in, in, in the Kansas City area, uh, I didn't really know there were uh, African-American people until I was about 10 years old. I didn't know there were Jewish people until we moved to Chicago when I was 14 years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and, then, and then my best friend was Jewish. But the thing, one of the things I learned was the, uh, the, the kids that were in Hebrew school, they would talk about the rabbis and pill pull. Well, what is pill pull? Well, the rabbis, the tradition, the rabbis will get together and a few of them will get together and they'll spend a week arguing about the interpretation of a single verse of scripture. Oh, wow. Thought, wow. That's the reason Jewish kids are so good, good attorneys. <laughs> they know how to argue either side. Well, they and, argue you know, back and forth all the time. And right? frankly, you know, this is one of the things that I find dismaying in our educational system is, you know, when I went to college also, uh, the, the program that I went was in was called the college of letters, which was history, philosophy, and, and, um, history, philosophy, and literature. And so just about all classes were conducted not on a, liter on a lecture basis, but on a seminar basis. So we, we, there would be about 30 people in a seminar, all of us uh, in the same program. And there was a lot of di discussion and debate was encouraged. Uh, 
and and I think also that was another place where I literally learned to argue either side. And that is a skill, even if you don't plan to be an attorney, that is a skill I think that every intelligent voter, if you will, citizen of a democracy needs to understand. And, you know, also yeah. in, in high school, we had a mandatory class called Problems of Democracy. Now, I don't know whether that's still taught, but this literally was... What is the Declaration of Independence? What is the Constitution? What, what, you know, what is this thing called the Electoral College? How does that work? Uh, you know, when do you need two thirds majority in the Congress to pass something instead of, you know, fifty-one percent? Those kinds of things. This was this was taught uh, with us to, to to us to be responsible citizens. And there was another course that I had. It was a, it was an advanced course in high school, but I'm so glad I took it. It was called um, United States Diplomatic History. And one of the things I learned in diplomatic history was that applies absolutely to this day. The teacher said, remember, Russia will always covet warm water ports. Well, what is the Black Sea? What is the port of Odessa? Most of the ports in, the, in, in Russia are frozen over much of the year. Okay? And... Many people in our news media really didn't publicize this. Many people are completely unaware of the fact that Russia has two main nuclear submarine bases. One of them is Vladivostok, north of Japan. The other one is in Sebastopol, which is at the tip of where? The Crimea. So if the Ukrainian government had changed to a government that was unfriendly to Russia, what would... Vladimir Putin have done to protect a nuclear submarine base to keep it from falling into the wrong hands. Now, I'm not saying he's justified. I'm saying that this is how I might put on my hat and think like the other side and think like, why is he doing what he's doing? Is that for him to say that Crimea is strategically important to Russia is absolutely, totally true. And, um, I'm also reminded, and you know, more recently, of uh, Rachel Maddow has a book called Blowout, uh, which is about the uh, influence of the uh, oil industry globally in in diplomatic history, geopolitical history. And she points out that Vladimir Putin made a very conscious decision to rebuild the wealth of the former Soviet Union in Russia based on oil and gas. Oh. Which, which he made sure to control because the oligarch who got too big for his britches got thrown in jail and Putin took over his assets because he was looking too much like a president or a prime minister. Um, so Putin controls oil and gas uh, through Rosneft, is the uh, Russian, uh, one of the main Russian oil companies. But one of the things about Ukraine is that when the puppet, when Putin put the pu puppet government into Kiev, into Kiev, into Kiev, he decreed that um, not only would Ukraine not produce their own natural gas, they would buy it from Russia. They would permit Russia, a Russian pipeline, to go across Ukraine so they could sell natural gas to Germany, which is where Germany got most of its of its uh, gas for heating and, and uh, industrial uses. And not only that, but the Ukrainians would not only have to buy natural gas from Russia, they also were taxed on the, on the gas that they bought from Russia, which is all money going back into, yes, Putin and his oligarchs' pockets. So that, that degree of oppression certainly existed. And the other thing that I think people are completely unaware of, uh, unless you follow U.S. diplomatic history, is why was... Why in the previous uh, administration was Rex Tillerson put in as Secretary of State? Rex Tillerson was, was president of Exxon, okay? He was not a, a career diplomat. You know, Tony Blinken is in there now as a, as a career diplomat, okay? Madeleine Albright was a career diplomat, but Rex Tillerson was an oil company executive, okay? Well, why was he put in there? Well, the U.S. had issued sanctions against Russia, and those sanctions forbade U.S. oil companies from dealing with the Russian oil companies. 
And one of the places that the Russian oil companies really want to dig is in Siberia. And they want to use fracking technology to get some of that, some of that oil out. Well, the Russians don't have that technology. Exxon does. So the two goals of that previous administration was to get the sanctions lifted as soon as possible and send Rex Tillerson in there to make sure that we get a chunk of it. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Tillerson lasted about a week in the job <laughs> because he, he got somewhat disgusted. And, 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 and this, you know, we're, we're, we're all over the place, but I think you'll find this interesting. This is while we were in Kenya. We were living in Kenya. And that was about the time that Tillerson came in as Secretary of State. And the we, I was, we were talking in the, in the, when I was in the green room about the, the Kenyan national elections are coming up in the beginning of August. And they were, they were rather tumultuous last time. And this was before our contested election. This was about a couple of years before our contested election. The, the Kenyan election was contested. And the loser... Uh, held an alternative swearing-in ceremony that was attended by hundreds of thousands of people, and there was there were riots and and um, and bad blood all, all around. And but then, very shortly afterward, uh, and well, the the fellow who was in charge of the computer system to count the votes, he was found murdered. And then after that, the, the uh, opposition leader who had complained. It's a parliamentary system, so he he jumped back into the government, and suddenly he was kind of tight with the president. Um, but what happened while we were there, and this, this this had been going on for about a year, they were trying to figure out who really had power in the government. It had been going on for about a year. Rex Tillerson showed up on a goodwill tour of Africa. He came to Kenya, had his photograph taken with two fellows, his arms around the two fellows, opposition leaders. The day Tillerson left, they're there shaking hands, <laughs> grinning at each other, and oh, the United States are going to help us build this road. And and the other thing is that that there above uh, Nairobi, there's a whole uh, mountainside full of windmills for electricity, and they go, wow, this is really progressive. Thing was that I took a hike up there; they weren't connected to the power grid. There are no power lines going up there. So the other thing that the United States was going to pay for was hooking the windmills to the power grid. Okay, well, I can just imagine the scene between those two those two government officials is Tillerson probably opened up his checkbook and said, what is it going to take for you two guys to settle down? <laughs> he rips a check out, hands it to him, and the day Tillerson's gone is like, okay, how much of this do I get? Because <laughs> we, we took the Americans for a ride again. Now, you know, it, it's it's not that the Kenyans are exploiting the Americans because they borrow from everybody. Okay. And that's, that's not, you know, they're equal opportunity borrowers, <laughs> but, but I would just say that, you know, that, that type of checkbook journalism goes on, of course, uh, all day long around the world uh, um, among all kinds of, of countries and, and world world um, IMF fund, World Development Bank, you know, that kind of stuff. But we don't really get those headlines in our papers. And, and you know, that's those stories tend to be buried in the back. And I, that that bothers me that our students are, you know, we're and yes, over the last week, we're, of course, we want to pay attention to what's going on with gun violence, try to see if we can't find some some so some I won't say solutions some mitigations here uh, some common ground between all the parties but that completely you know that completely uh, uh, swamped any other stories about what was going on in 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 other parts of the world and yes we've been focused on Ukraine but also you know there's been there's been some there's been some violence in South Africa that's very significant I've got some colleagues there and we've been discussing uh, uh, the rise of authoritarianism uh, all over the world, um, and and it's it's also true there because people, let's put it this way, people want the trains to run on time. You know they 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 want they want it they want less crime in the streets. They, they, and but the problem is, if you invite an authoritarian government in in to take care of that, they might, 
but careful what you ask for because you won't like you won't like the rest of the things that they impose on you. Yeah, exactly. You just won't. And it it, it amazes me that you know we're talking you know assault weapons, for example. <laughs> the young, these young guys that are striding around with their assault weapons and insisting on taking them to public demonstrations and 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 brandishing them in grocery stores and whatever, they seem to want. An authoritarian leader. I dare I name. I you know we won't name names, but if if that if that if they were to get what they ask for, I would think that 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 authoritarian leader has declared that he admires somebody who's president for life, like Xi in China. Well, if he's going to be president for life, guess what? <laughs> There's there might not be a gun buyback. They might just they might just take them all back because you know there's no there's no way that a president for for life could ever tolerate even the beginnings of a revolutionary movement. And supposedly that's the reason we have the Second Amendment is so that we there could be a revolutionary movement if 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 um, if the wrong people got in power. So I'm not understanding you know as a debater, I can't really argue the other side of that debate because I don't understand it. Yeah, I just don't. Well, I want to get I want to get into your tea before we wrap up your show because the time is going by really fast here, bro. I do a couple of rant, and I apologize. <laughs> no, and that's okay, and that's freedom of speech, right? We're allowed to express ourselves, and and that's exactly what you were doing was you were, were expressing yourself in that, and you you are the guest, so you're allowed to talk, you're allowed to ramble. Um, but I want to get into your tea, Gerald. What makes your T? So if I ask you what your T is and you give me a word for each letter, starting with the T-E-A, what would your T be? Well, T would certainly be thinking. And my blog uh, on GeraldEverettJones.com is titled Thinking About Thinking. And I often, I'll review literary novels. I will comment on um, Big Bang Theory and what does that mean for the origin of the universe and does that mean that the, the that these processes of the so-called godless universe are are does it confirm them and of course the answer is nobody knows quite yet but but yes I I, I look into astrophysics and theology and all these things that intrigue me and I had a I had a TV show uh, thinking about thinking on GMAP TV we did four episodes and that proved to be somewhat impractical I, I that i may relaunch that series on another channel oh uh, cool thinking, thinking so t is my t is my thinking thinking so what would your e be well it would have to be education and along with education i would say excellence and i was listening to a um an admittedly left-wing uh, radio show the other day and they were talking about um U.S. history, and they were saying, well, you know, during the Vietnam War, Nick, the Nixon administration, it seemed like the establishment said to themselves, you know, universal public education is a bad idea. These kids are just too, they think they're too smart. And it does seem as though it's not that the police have been defunded during that time. It's pr pretty much education that's been defunded during that time. And I see all this controversy about parents being upset about what's going on in the schools. I don't know how much times have changed, but back when I was in, in grade school, you couldn't drag some of the parents to a parent-teacher meeting. They had no clue what was going on in school. They, yeah, knew, they, what, didn't. they knew what was on the report card. you know. And, and you that's know, what you got punished for was what was on the report card. <laughs> I got punished for, you know, a B minus because they knew that I was just faking it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> then I went to college and I got an A plus in astronomy. And my dad said, how, how do you get higher than an A? <laughs> how oh, did you do that? Oh, that's what I you were like, doing. Like, well, it was interesting. Astronomy, uh, well, off the track again, but in this wonderful astronomy course in mm -hmm. freshman year, the first semester was the history of astronomy. The history of astronomy. The second course was astrophysics, but without with no calculus, which is fine because it's all algebra. So I, you know, it was basically what they called it, what the scientists would call an appreciation course. It wasn't hard science, but it was an incredibly valuable, incredibly valuable course. So, and what would your A be? I I, I just said it. Astronomy. I okay. I just it, it. I I never cease to be just 
amazed. I don't know if you've seen that on Facebook. There is um, there's a video animation that starts with the Earth, and it zooms out, and it zooms out, and it zooms out, and it zooms out to the edge of the known universe. And nothing is going to make you feel smaller than seeing the extent of what's out there. Because when I was in school, the universe was kind of the solar system and then some. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, in more recent years, oh, the solar system and then the Milky Way. All right, well, now we find out there's a hundred million Milky Ways. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't teach us all the Milky Ways and, in school. And, and, and the, the universe is not only 13 billion years old, but, uh, but because it expanded in all directions, it's actually, it's actually something like 30 billion years across in terms of light years. Well, that means we, we will never, ever be able to see to the edge of it. Because light would have the light from the far side of the universe, the opposite side of the universe from us, is only halfway to us by now. And we look in the sky. The other thing that they don't even discuss this in astronomy courses: what you're looking at is mostly gone. Wow. Those star, those stars have died. Some of them billions of years ago. Some of them hundreds of millions of years ago. But it takes that light so long to get to us. That we we're looking at the at history when we look at the sky. We're looking at history, and we know enough about astrophysics to say, okay, we understand how stars evolve. They begin they begin this way. They they collapse. They expand. They become supernovas. Then they then they collapse again. We we they generate heavier and heavier elements, which is why we know that because we are. We are the planet of a young star. We have a we have you know a huge periodic table of elements. Well, that started with hydrogen and it had to be cooked over. We're we're made of stardust that's billions of years old. The molecules in our bodies never died. Okay, so we know enough about stellar evolution to say we think those stars that disappeared were replaced by other stars. Okay, nobody knows where they were whether they were. <laughs> so there's a lot. To know there's a lot to wonder about there's a lot to discover but then when you realize what the immensity of what's out there and you also realize that we are as as being made of stardust and that those molecules are billions of years old and that it took let's see the earth is four billion years ago uh, year, years old Humans are hundreds of millions of well, mammals are hundreds hundreds of millions of years old. Human beings are probably maybe maybe two million years old. Um, that's got to make you feel like a very lucky being. <laughs> You're extremely special. And it was interesting. I, I've had debates with um, with some um, um, shall we call them. Um, conservative Christians, um, you know, creationists, if you will, and you know they, they talk about um, the godless universe and, and and whatever. But I, I will, I will add that the specialness of creation and and of who and what we are, whether there's other civilizations or not, which have undoubtedly in my mind there are, is still an immensely wonderful thing. And it was a scientist. It was, um, I don't recall his name right now, but it was a fellow who's involved in, in the, um, in the, in the, in the, in the um, asteroid detection project, you know, because um, don't look up. There was a lot of publicity about that movie and, you know, could, could an asteroid wipe us out. And, um, uh, but, but this, this physicist, a uh, young guy, uh, said, well, you know, it could very well be that, that the purpose of humans is to simply find meaning in the universe. And I, I, I you know, that, a chill went up and down my spine. Yeah. Because, you know, again, I was talking about Milton Erickson before. The Milton Erickson, you know, he fond of saying human beings, what are human beings? Meaning making machines. Oh, I that, like that. 
I've that never is how we survive. You, you, the, the primitive men, go, or primitive men, primitive women walk, walk out of the hut and it's like, uh, what's there to eat? What is it likely to eat me? And uh, who can I have sex with? <laughs> right? right? <laughs> and you've got to interpret all these stimuli from your environment is, you know, there, and one of the things I learned in Kenya and on safari is how, you know, these, these, these tour guides would, they would, they, they go, oh, there's a, there's a kite up there, which is a type of um, a Kenyan uh, raptor, like an eagle. There's a kite up there. I, I, I'm looking at the same tree you are. I don't see it. And he says, do you see the leaves? What, what do you mean? He, he said, well, the, the, you can see what, how the wind is blowing the other leaves in the tree. Those leaves are not moving the same way. <laughs> so there's something there. So that, that made him train his eye there long enough to see the edge of the wing or to see oh. the bill, the shadow of the bill. Mm -hmm. So again, these are, these are people who spend their lives in the outdoors and they learn how to interpret you know, whether there's, whether there's, um, uh, you know, leavings on the ground or, you know, a, a, a carcass here or, and I, 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 and I certainly, I, I recommend uh, wildlife tourism, ecotourism, uh, safaris uh, to every, everyone who can manage it. But I will say, if you're on safari, uh, you, you do want to consider whether you're going to take young children along because you are likely to see Today, you are likely to see, I mean, we saw three cheetahs tear apart a, a wildebeest calf while its mother watched. Oh. I mean, this is, this is nature. That's okay? pretty graphic. Yeah. And, so, yeah. And um, you, people are eager to, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, because we're interested in eye candy on TV, you know, we want to see things blow up or whatever it is, but we want to, want to see blood and gore, but, you know, tourists do want to see this stuff. And yep. And the, the guides will take them there. Um, but, you know, you, you have to be prepared that um, you, will, you will understand better how the natural world works. And somebody would point to a zebra and they say, they say, do you know what a zebra is? And I said, well, it's like a horse and, you know, it grazes. And he says, a zebra is lion food. That is, that it, that it, a zebra will either die of illness and it will be devoured by hyenas and 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 um, and raptors, uh, uh, vultures, or or um, it will it will be picked off by a lion. Wow. But those are the two ways. You're not going to find a zebra carcass uh, on the savanna. You're going to find zebra bones. Oh my goodness! Been, because it's been the 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 wild recycles everyone and everything. And that's just the way it is. Well, it's almost like a good storytelling too, right? Because you need to go out and experience the world to see the world so that you can write about it, right? Well, you do. And like I said, uh, Kenya made me much more aware of, of corruption. It also made me much more aware of what I would call transactional love. I think that I think in, in many ways, all human interactions are transactional. And, and you know, Kenyans will tell you that they're fond of gaming each other. And it, that's one of the themes in, in my book, uh, Harry Harambe's uh, Kenyan Sundowner. Let's see. That's, that's uh, this book here. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah. And these are the awards. <laughs> well, look that, at you. That, Congratulations. Look at all those yeah. awards on there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 uh, Harry Harry Gardner, uh, who gets the nickname Harambi, which means all for one, um, that's also the Kenyan national motto. He has to come. He he falls in love with. Uh, he's a widower. Falls in love with a Kenyan woman who's also who's a widow, and she's something of. He she's got some mystery associated with her. She's got a past that she really won't talk about, and Harry has to ask himself. While he's in the sunset of his life, he has to ask of himself. Am I being played? And then the second question he asks him, himself after he has another drink is, do I mind? <laughs> I'm having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> in Los Angeles, I was just playing golf and, you know, bridge and <laughs> getting set up on boring dates. So, um, you know, it's a, it, it is a different world. And yet it, it has, it has, uh, it has a 
a universal quality, you know, no matter where you go in the world and no matter how well-traveled you are, uh, you're going to find um, human frailties and, and, and rivalries and jealousies and loves and passions uh, among uh, all walks of life. And it's thrilling to, it, it also gives you a sense of community. It also gives you a sense of being a citizen of the world of, you know, I, I, I personally believe Kenya is growing so fast. I really think that it's going to be, I think it's going to be the Silicon Valley of, of, of Kenya. I, you know, there, there are so many bright young people, their educational system. There are a lot of college educated um, Kenyans who, who they're having trouble finding, finding work, uh, because, especially because of COVID. But, um, yeah. and, and you've got a population explosion there. There's, there's, there, it's truly not enough work. <clears throat> but um, it's a, a resource-rich country. It is a primarily a democracy, or par parliamentary democracy. Um, yes, it's got its issues. It's actually got its racial issues, but its racial issues are among the 43 different Kenyan tribes yeah. or ethnic societies. Um, as a, as a, um, as a so-called colonialist uh, white person, be you American or English, or, I mean, uh, European, um, you're likely to be treated like royalty. It's like, you know, uh, by the way, our money's in your pocket. You just don't know it yet. Do you want to invest in a business? <laughs> do you want to have a good dinner? <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to have a hotel room? And I mean, uh, Kenyan hospitality, I mean, you can stay in safari camps that are literally tents like mm -hmm. Teddy Roosevelt would have pitched when he was on safari. And they're on the banks of rivers that have got crocodiles crawling out of them. Fortunately, the banks are too steep for the crocodiles to get up. But you'll be sitting at a table with a white linen tablecloth with real sterling silver in China and, uh, in front of you. And, uh, and the, you know, the waiter comes over. He's wearing a, 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 a black tie and a white shirt. And he's got, he's got a linen uh, uh, serviette over his arm. And I said, well, what's your name? And he says, Kennedy. <laughs> so, Jared, what final words do you have for the listeners out there? On I would have... say if you are, we were going to talk about self-publishing a bit. And we didn't yep. do too much of it. But I would say if you're an aspiring author, especially if it's your first or second book, um, don't spend a year or two or three chasing agents and publishers um, either publish with a hybrid publisher where you uh, defray some of the cost or uh, le learn the rules of self-publishing, but by all means, jump in the game. You okay. Learning the book industry, learning social media, learning promotion, learning how to reach a fan base and an audience. That is how you make it these days. Whether you are, whether you sign with Simon and Schuster or whether you, you know, have, you know, La Puerta Books and Media, which is my impression. Well, I want to thank you, Daryl, for joining me today on Tea Time and sharing all of those incredible stories because you gave us an, an educational lesson on a lot of different topics today. And I really want to thank you for sharing that with us. So if anybody would like to reach out to you, where could they reach out to you? Well, again, the website, GeraldEverettJones.com. That's uh, Gerald with a G, Everett with two T's. And on the landing page, there will be a complimentary copy, ebook copy of Preacher Finds a Corpse, which is the first book in that mystery series. So free book, what's not to like. And also there you will find my blog, the Thinking About Thinking series. And you can comment on that blog, share it with your friends. And I do show up on Facebook and Twitter and, and Instagram. Uh, so, you know, you can look for me there as well. If you Google my name, my full name, um, if you do just Gerald Jones, you might get um, who knows who you get. If you if you Google my full full name, it's the results are pretty much all me. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much all you, right? <laughs> it's all about it's all about me. I got what it's I all asked. about me. It's all about me. It's what I asked for. Well, I want to thank you for joining me and sharing your tea with me because it really was a powerful tea, and it was an honor to sit and have tea with you today on Tea Time. And I want to thank the viewers and listeners out there. And if you're watching the replay, push hashtag replay where you're tuning in from. I'd love to hear where you're tuning in from. 
And if you'd like to know more on Gerald, you can check out my Facebook page. His full bio will be there. And it will be also in the description for all of the audio platforms that are tuning in and listening to Tea Time. I do appreciate each and every one of you. I will be joining you back on June 9th with a lady from Finland. She is from the United States, but now is living in Finland. So we're going to bring some Finland into and have some tea in Finland. Uh, she's going to be talking about taking risks, travel, love, and music. So that's going to be an incre incredible tea time. And then we're going to jump in and have some other authors join us in the in the month of June. So in June, there's books for everyone. So if you're a reader, you want to grab some of these books. And you want to grab a copy of Gerald's uh, book as well. And a free book. Like, what what's better than that, right? And, you know, and it's a good book to grab. And enjoy over a cup of tea. So again, thank you all for joining me today on Tea Time with Miss Liz. And Gerald, thank you again for sitting and having tea with me. It was an honor. Uh, oh, and gracious, and I will see everyone June 10th, uh, June 9th at 10 a.m. So it will be a morning tea time because of the time zone. So again, thank you all for tuning in today on Tea Time with Miss Liz.